I am personally pleased to be here today to be introducing my friend Mark, who has just cringed at my dramatic pause. Um, Mark has over 30 years of leadership experience in managing, engineering, and operating internet technologies. Presently, he serves as an independent consultant, but I met him when he was working at MCNC, the uh, Research and Educational Backbone Network for the state of North Carolina. Throughout his career, Mark has navigated the internet's evolution from the adoption of TCP IP to the emergence of the web and the proliferation of home broadband internet access. He is um, the Raleigh news station WRAL's uh, resident network expert, and he lets me know every time they quote him. For more than 20 years, he spearheaded MCNC's regional and national network activities, overseeing a remarkable 25,000-fold increase in internet usage. Currently, Mark holds the positions of board member and president at the Internet Legacy Institute, an organization devoted to preserving the history of the internet, particularly the NSFNet era. Uh, he has one dog who tried to eat my child, uh, two and a half grandbabies, the half is still baking, it has not been King Solomon, um, and a very, very patient wife. Um, we are very happy to welcome him as a keynote speaker today. Welcome, Mark. Well, that introduction went better than I anticipated. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, history of the internet uh, in North Carolina. And so some of it will be r direct history and some will be sort of internet adjacent things that happened that I was able to be a part of or know about that resulted in uh, some interesting stories here and there. Um, and uh, so uh, let's, let's dive in. So the first thing I wanted to do was give some credit to a few people on the front end of this rather than the back end because people usually tune out when you give the credits at the end. So a few people that were key in uh, setting things up for the development of the internet in North Carolina. I'll start with uh, Governor Jim Hunt who was governor for four terms. North Carolina is a two term, two consecutive term limited state so he was governor two terms, sat out a term and was governor for two more. One of the things that he did early in his first term was to set up MCNC as an uh, independent nonprofit. Uh, in the early days, it was uh, funded by the state, and it was known as the Microelectronics Center of North Carolina. Uh, that Microelectronics Center business has gone, has been long gone for uh, probably 25 years now, but the, the, the initials persist. Um, and uh, he was also uh, a, a very big advocate of technology in general and particularly uh, in education, which played a role in development of internet later. Uh, number two is Jane Smith Patterson, who was Governor Hunt's top lieutenant in all four administrations. Uh, she was responsible for the North Carolina Information Highway. Well, she was also uh, responsible for implementing the uh, initial building of MCNC, responsible for the North Carolina Information Highway. She started the Rural Internet Access Authority, uh, which became ENC later on and still works hard in uh, pushing broadband out to un and underserved populations. Uh, Henry Schaefer is uh, Professor Emeritus in Genetics at North Carolina State University. Uh, he was the initial PI on uh, North Carolina's uh, connection to Suranet in the early 80s and one of the key people who uh, helped make the decision for networking in North Carolina to be based on TCP IP as opposed to uh, SNA or DECnet, both of which were uh, quite likely possibilities back in the day. TCP IP was not a uh, foregone conclusion in any way, especially sitting in IBM's backyard. 
Uh, Henry also did a stint as the CIO for the university system in North Carolina. And uh, last on my list is Alan Blatecki, who was uh, implemented the microwave network at MCNC, and was later uh, vice president over both uh, supercomputing and networking at MCNC. After that, Alan uh, went to NSF, where he started the NSF middleware program, which resulted in the uh, uh, trust and identity uh, system that uh, higher ed uh, uses today. Uh, after NSF, he, uh, he came to, back to North Carolina uh, and helped found the Renaissance Computing Institute at UNC, uh, which shows up much later in some of the advanced networking activities that are going on today. So this is a little bit of a timeline to give you some sense of some of the major things that happened and the uh, overlap between some of those activities. We'll get back to some of those, but it goes, uh, the first thing on the timeline was Usenet, which was created in uh, North Carolina between University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and Duke, actually in 1979. Um, and for those of you youngsters here, Usenet is sort of the, uh, the functional ancestor of Reddit. I guess it's the best way to think of it. So it, with all the good and bad that you might associate with Reddit, um, the, uh, the networking part, the, as we recognize it, started a little bit later. So we'll talk about all the things on this picture as, as we go through. Um, so I mentioned the creation of MCNC, um, AS81 which was, uh, dates to 1986. I was looking it up this morning. I think MCNC can probably claim to be the oldest service provider, uh, AS, that's the same organization that registered it in the first place. For those of you from Lumen who uh, are very proud of AS1, it's, uh, you had to buy that, I'll point out. <laughs> um, and mcnc.org was actually the sixth .org domain registered. Uh, so uh, been around for a little while. Uh, as I mentioned, MCNC was uh, Microelectronics Center of North Carolina and was created to sort of bring the microelectronic, well, at least the theory was, to bring the microelectronics industry to Research Triangle Park. Uh, in particular, they wanted IBM to expand what it was doing in the park. Um, and as part of that, uh, they were interested in having the universities collaborate uh, among themselves and with uh, corporations. So a video conferencing system was created. Uh, talk about that in a minute. I would need to point out this early network diagram centered on MCNC. Uh, it's a bunch of axes, and the, the highest speed link you'll see on this was uh, 9.6. Uh, so it was a really state-of-the-art high-performance network at the time. Um, so I mentioned there was a, let me see if I can, there we go. Uh, so they decided to build this video conferencing network to enable collaboration amongst the, uh, the universities and MCNC and the commercial partners in microelectronics. Uh, they quickly determined that it was cheaper to build their own microwave network than it was to lease capacity from the phone company. So, uh, this uh, microwave network with this footprint that you see on this diagram uh, was developed around 1985. The, uh, the transmission was 45 megabit equivalent. The video was transmitted as uh, analog video over that capacity. And there was a T1 uh, that came as part of that capacity that was used for data networking. An interesting side story on this is when they were looking for sites, uh, you need a line of sight for microwave and they were looking for high points. One of the locations in the western part of the state was on property that was owned by Billy Graham. And uh, they had some protracted negotiations with, with the Billy Graham family because his son Franklin was concerned that inappropriate content would be transmitted over this network. Uh, little did they know. <laughs> it probably wasn't that bad when it first started, but uh, we all know the internet. Um, 
So uh, that was put together early, and uh, having that facilities-based networking experience turned out to be a valuable asset to us later when we got out of the microwave business and into the fiber business. Um, so the, the video network was, uh, you can, if you're familiar with Cisco's later telepresence uh, product that they have, the concept was basically identical, uh, although this was a good 15 years before the telepresence effort at Cisco. Um, there were very strict room requirements. The, the idea was to make it feel like when you were having a, a meeting that the other people were in the same room with you. So the, uh, there were very strict requirements on the layouts of the room, the lighting in the room, uh, the sound uh, management in the room. Uh, the typical room would have four to six seating positions, each with a dedicated camera plus a wide angle camera for the whole room, plus a camera pointed down at the desk for documents. Uh, there was no way to share documents uh, directly online, so we took a picture of paper back in the day. Behind each room was a control room, uh, like a smaller version of the one in this picture, uh, with a person in it at each meeting who had controls over the, the microphone for each seating position, and they could manage the audio uh, so if somebody was rustling papers or making noise, they could turn down the, the audio in real time. Um, then that video was transmitted back to a central location at MCNC and uh, mixed and sent back out to, the, uh, to all the other sites. Uh, there was also a, a human operator in the middle at MCNC uh, doing the same kind of thing. They could manage the audio for a site and they had a uh, basically like a, a party line voice connection among all the sites participating in a conference and uh, could troubleshoot problems in real time. This was important uh, because pretty quickly the, the use cases expanded uh, beyond just microelectronics collaboration to include telehealth and medical school grand rounds. So uh, in medical schools, the, each hospital typically has a grand rounds where the residents and interns meet and present cases to each other. Well, there were three medical schools in North Carolina at the time, and they would have combined grand rounds where they would all meet over video and present cases. <clears throat> and there were also four credit classes at the universities taught over this, and uh, a regularly scheduled meeting of the university chancellors. Uh, all of those things uh, the participants felt like were pretty important, and they so it was, it was key to be able to uh, keep the quality up and the uh, uh, and troubleshoot things in real time. Uh, but it was a very human intensive effort. Uh, scheduling the network was also very intensive and uh, not susceptible to automation uh, for many years because the rooms were multi-purpose typically at, at the insights and there was a lot of negotiation associated with uh, getting a room lined up with a class, lined up across multiple institutions, and uh, uh, much as we tried, there was no good way to, uh, to automate that. So that sort of took us through the, uh, the, the 80s. Uh, in the beginning of the 1990s, there was a, uh, an interesting collaboration between the state and the big three ILEX in North Carolina at the time, which were Bell South, Sprint Local, and GTE. Uh, today, those have morphed into AT&T, Lumen, and Verizon, I think, are the, uh, the descendants of those. Um, so the state, uh, again led by Jane Patterson, got those three telcos to agree on a common service, which was based on ATM, and uh, a common structure for, for how you would pay for that. The, uh, and they all implemented the same Fujitsu carrier class ATM switches, uh, but because this was in the days of LADAs, the, uh, they could not make the connections themselves, so the state bought interlada links from AT&T to connect these three switches, and then uh, AT, uh, Bell South ran a, uh, a video MCU in the middle to, uh, to operate a, a video conferencing network that was uh, 
a pretty close uh, approximation of the video standards that MCNC had with their analog video. Um, the a typical site configuration had a, a CPE device that was also made by Fujitsu that broke out a DS3 and a T1. Uh, and the, the DS3 was connected to a codec for video, so it was 45 megabit uh, video. And uh, again, this was uh, approximately broadcast standard quality, standard definition television. There was no HD TV back in the day. And uh, T1 for data. Because it was sort of the nature of the telcos at the time, uh, this was a usage-based service. And uh, But interestingly, they had no mechanism for counting the, the usage, actually. So it was calculated. Calculating was pretty easy on the video side. The, the DS3 was fully utilized when a uh, when a conference was in session, so you just did the math on on what the utilization was for the period of time the conference was active. On the data side, it was a bit of a different story. Um, so the data that we used uh, used a protocol called SMDS that I'm not sure I've ever seen in, anybody else use in in real life. Uh, but the uh, and so that gave us a, a data connection. And we were able to argue, based on some perhaps shaky data uh, that we had for, for the use of internet by universities, that uh, the internet, the data side of the line, was never fully utilized. In fact, uh, during parts of the day, it would be very lightly utilized. And we managed to talk them into uh, a calculated cost for the data circuits that was quite a bit less than a full T1, which was key, because it would have been pretty expensive. Uh, had we not talked them into that. Um, and also probably didn't particularly apply. So MCNC used this for data service, but, it, but we put an ATM switch at the end of the lines and had 10 to 20 megabits was typically what we initially had then. Uh, and they used the same algorithm for calculating that, even though universities had people there 24 seven and computer to computer transmissions. So, uh, pays to know more than the person you're negotiating with, I think, is the moral of that story. Um, the, uh, and that was, uh, that served us well for, for quite some time. I guess, uh, just to give you an idea of what this cost, so the, the nominal service delivery was an OC3, uh, which in the early 1990s was quite a lot of capacity, um, and delivered over fiber. Uh, the, there was an installation cost that varied slightly across the three providers, but was approximately $1,500, no matter where you went in the state. Uh, they turned up a site at Hatteras High School that required 40 miles of fiber run down the Outer Banks, and the installation was $1,500, so it was a pretty good, pretty good deal for them. Uh, not such a good deal for Bell South, um, especially since that road gets washed out about every other year. Um, but um, and a typical monthly rate, uh, including all the utilization charges, was about four thousand dollars a month, which was a really good deal for a OC3 at that time. But it was a lot of money for a school, and that eventually turned into the demise of NCIH because uh, that was more than could be uh, funded in the General Assembly. They they lost their uh, their will to provide that much money to the to the end users. So, and the, really from the MCNC point of view, the, the death of uh, NCIH uh, was Y2K. So when we got to Y2K, Bell South and their infinite wisdom decided that the Fujitsu switches were not gonna be Y2K compliant, and so they had to switch what they were doing. And in the process of switching, they were gonna downgrade the video quality from uh, broadcast quality to a, a highly compressed T1 video, and that was not acceptable uh, on the MCNC side anyway. The, uh, the schools and other smaller sites that were using NCIH uh, agreed to that, but uh, we were not willing to do that in our network. We had been experimenting with NC State with some video over IP using MPEG-2. Uh, we had a company that was building MPEG-2 codecs 
which were really expensive because the MPEG-2 protocol was designed for broadcast, so it's an expensive computationally uh, process on the sending side and a really cheap one on the receiving side. So if you're a broadcast station, you have an encoder that's expensive and then consumer uh, available uh, decoders on the other end. But if you're doing interactive video conferencing, every site needs an encoder. Uh, and the way we had to do it was we were mixing video in the center of the network, so every site needed a pair of these expensive codecs to turn up. Um, we got news that they were going to uh, discontinue the, the video service in like September of 1999. We immediately placed orders for all of our sites for D DS3s um, and during the Christmas break uh, turned down the entire ATM network and turned up a uh, uh, DS3 based IP network and uh, MPEG-2 codecs at each site. Uh, only one site missed, if I recall, uh, because Bell South couldn't meet their delivery date, even though they they had four months. I'm not bitter or anything, but uh, they, <laughs> um, so uh, we, as far as we know, that was the first uh, really production for pay video conferencing, uh, interactive video conferencing done over IP uh, anywhere. So uh, we were fairly proud of that, even though it was sort of an emergency decision on our part uh, to do that. Um, so I think we're going to back up in time now a little bit. So uh, that NCIH carried us through about the year, uh, right until the year 2000. If we back up to the mid-90s, the, uh, the NSF was uh, privatizing the NSF backbone and commercial internet providers were starting to, to crop up. In North Carolina, uh, two uh, popped up almost instantly. One was the uh, run by the News and Observer uh, newspaper, also known as the NNO, and they called their network NandoNet, NNO Net. Um, NandoNet uh, started out as a little bit of the dominant player, but quickly sort of became just the uh, the digital presence for the newspaper and the, the dial-up part uh, went away. The other um, big uh, provider to jump in was Capital Broadcasting Company who was operated a TV station in Raleigh and who was tended to be tech forward anyway. They created a uh, startup uh, dial-up provider called Interpath and MCNC who had been running some dial-up uh, server banks on behalf of universities in different places in the state sold uh, all that hardware and the user base to Interpath uh, to get them started uh, and, uh, and get out from under that business which was uh, people and money intensive uh, they were and so uh, and it wasn't really our core business so Interpath um, was a tiny little company at the same time uh, as the uh, as they were starting the dial-up business. The local power company, uh, Carolina Power and Light, was starting a, a telecom business using uh, fiber assets. They have OP, they had OPG, OPGW uh, fiber in the transmission lines, and they had a, a two-person operation behind this telecom effort um, that was uh, we referred. We called them Dan and Dave because they were named Dan and Dave. And uh, if you remember, uh, in the lead up to the 1996 Olympics, there was this big advertising campaign about these two decathletes called Dan and who were uh, Dan, also Dan and Dave. So it was uh, sort of the shorthand that we referred to them by. Uh, they were not Olympic caliber decathletes. Uh, the uh, so that. Uh, they were starting, it was a very uh, modest operation, uh, but shortly after they got into business, uh, the Florida utility Progress Energy bought or merged with CPNL, and uh, Progress Energy was also running a bit of a telecom, and they decided to outsource or spin out the, the whole IT department for the utility. 
uh, and they spun that out. They took the, the telecom uh, business with it, and then they bought Interpass, and they took the name Interpath. So suddenly, Interpath went from a tiny dial-up operation to a well-funded, uh, pretty large, uh, full-service ISP. They uh, touted themselves as being an application service provider, uh, and they went. They began rapidly uh, buying, building fiber all over the state. Um, and in fact, uh, we bought fiber from them. We, a consortium of MCNC, NC State, Duke, and UNC, bought fiber about a hundred mile ring uh, in our area from them. It's the first fiber we acquired uh, as they were building out their network. Uh, we had lots of friends there, as you might imagine, the big ISP starting, and we were the only IP people in town. So a good number of MCNC people left as part of that. The CTO at Interpath had been the CIO at NC State. So uh, we, were, we were buddies with those folks. So they had a sort of rapid expansion, and then they were bought by Bain Capital, the private equity people who did what Bain Capital does, and uh, broke Interpath up into parts and sold them. Um, the uh, telecom, the sort of middle mile telecom part of that business ended up going back to Progress Energy, uh, and it was now called Progress Telecom, and uh, those assets are now in the Lumen portfolio after several acquisitions and uh, mergers and stuff. So that was uh, uh, sort of the, the first real facilities-based provider in, in North Carolina. Um, so also overlapping with that, we were busy in the late 90s with all kinds of things. So um, I mentioned the NSF breakup driving the commercial internet. Well, the universities uh, nationally were concerned that uh, as the internet was, the NSF net was commercialized, that these new uh, commercial for-profit ISPs were not going to design their networks to the benefit of the universities. Uh, they were going to design them to make money. Um, so this was concerning to the universities. In 1996, a group of 35 or 40 universities met in Monterey, California, and decided to form a nonprofit called Internet 2, which... Uh, at the time, it was a small number of universities. They all agreed, uh, among other things, to spend half a million dollars a year on the campus networking at their own universities. And uh, they would uh, continue to drive networking on the, at the national scale. Part of the outcome of that Monterey meeting was a white paper describing what they viewed as sort of the, the reference architecture, which uh, low, close universities would connect in a single point that they dubbed a gigapop to connect to uh, the, the Internet to National Network, which was originally the, uh, a, net, a network that was funded by a different network funded by NSF called the VBNS, which was very high-speed backbone network service. Um, the, uh, so this led to uh, an interesting legend story in North Carolina um, so we happened to have already had a relationship with Nortel, who was just down the street from us, and they had given us a, uh, an OC48 Sonnet system that, uh, and we had gotten Time Warner Telecom to donate uh, a pair of fibers connecting uh, the three big universities and MCNC, and we're just in the process of turning up this OC48, but we didn't have any immediate plans for using that in any production way. Um, and then we heard that Cisco was going to give UNC a kit of equipment uh, that included a big router and some campus switches and a few other odds and ends um, because it's the networking crowd at the universities was pretty small and all talked to each other. NC State and uh, Duke found out about this. Oh, the, the back story to that kit of equipment was that John Chambers' daughter was thinking about going to UNC and Cisco decided it would be good to give them a present uh, while that was happening. This, th that's the part that's a little bit legend, and I, uh, but it's the story that has stuck. Uh, 
So anyway, NC State and Duke got wind of this gift and went to Cisco and said, you can't just do that for one of the universities in the area. You need to give us the same thing. So Cisco acquiesced, and now three universities were getting stacks of gear from Cisco. And, uh, and my job at the time was to get us connected to this national backbone using the, the reference architecture. Um, and I looked. I saw what the universities were getting, and uh, and I knew we had this brand new OC48 network. And I called up a buddy of mine, John at Cisco, and said, "You know, if you could talk them into changing just a little bit the set of equipment you're giving to these guys, and give one more set to MCNC, we could build a properly good network." Uh, so they ended up uh, adding an ATM switch and giving a set. Uh, of that gear to MCNC, and we were able to pretty quickly turn up a uh, uh, an ATM triangle-wide ATM network um, on top of this uh, OC48 Sonnet system that we got for free from Nortel, on top of the free fiber that we got from Time Warner, and uh, and use that to uh, connect to the VBNS. But uh, we weren't completely happy with. Uh, how we were going to have to connect to the VBNS in North Carolina. Uh, the closest they got was Greensboro. And I had friends at Georgia Tech because I had worked there, and we figured out that we could actually share an OC3 connection for less money than it would take us to buy a DS3 out of Greensboro. And I got Interpath, the, the Dan and Dave Interpath, to uh, uh, cobbled together a circuit with, I think, four service providers in it uh, down to Atlanta where we shared an OC3 with Georgia Tech for our VBNS connection. That's on this picture as the SOX VBNS uh, picture. Uh, we did that, all that effort with sort of volunteer uh, support from the, from the universities and MCNC. Uh, we quickly realized that that was not a sustainable way to work. And Alan Blatecki, who I mentioned earlier, uh, went to a local uh, university consortium called Tukasi, which is a Triangle University uh, Center for Science or something like that. It's a very stealthy organization. But they happened to own the land that MCNC was sitting on. And they gave us a $5 million grant to pay for people at each of the universities uh, plus MCNC. And uh, we formed this uh, North Carolina networking initiative. I actually spoke to Nanog in 1998 about uh, this particular slide. I think uh, the picture was in my presentation from 1998. So it's, it's good to hang on to your slides. You never know that 25 years later you might have a use for them. Um, so uh, we started this NCNI initiative, and we had corporate partners. Nortel was a corporate partner. Part of the deal with corporate partners is they we liked it when they gave us equipment, but they had to give us a person, a full-time person assigned to this. And we ended up with Nortel and Cisco and Lucent all as corporate partners. Um, and we replaced the, uh, the Time Warner free fiber with the fiber that we paid for from Interpath. And we had three pair and we had three WDM systems at one point in time, a, a Nortel, a Cisco, and a Lucent system all running in parallel, <clears throat> all for free. Uh, so those were uh, those were kind of fun days. Um, a few of us, because Cisco's uh, Cisco was building a big presence in the in Research Triangle Park at the time because they wanted the IBM networking business, and uh, so they were hiring IBM network engineers right and left, and uh, and we were friends with those guys. And there were a few of us that had actual employee badges at Cisco and could walk in and out of their labs. Uh, unescorted for a while. So that that was kind of fun. Uh, I got fired from my dough dollar contractor thing when uh, the internet bubble burst and Cisco fired all their contractors. And uh, even though I was a zero dollar, we, we all lost our badges uh, unexpectedly that day. Um, so just a reminder of uh, what's going on. So we've talked about uh, NCIH and Interpath and NCNI. Um, the uh, another <coughs> big event that 
played into all this uh, that happened right about the time, right before and after the internet bubble split uh, occurred was MCNC was broken up into parts. Um, so in the late 90s, the state had sort of tired of direct funding MCNC and weaned us off of direct funding over a four year period. We went from, uh, I think it was $13 million a year from the state to zero. Uh, and uh, the microelectronics part of the company uh, became a contract research organization dedicated to making uh, intellectual property and spinning out companies. The network became a fee for service. Uh, supercomputing tried to become a fee for service operation and was eventually shut down because that didn't work well for, for supercomputing. Uh, one of the companies that got created uh, was called Kronos and they their particular magic was they made MEMS, micro microelectronic movable devices and they had they had a MEMS device that was an array of mirrors that could be individually moved which is the sort of thing you would want if you're going to build an all optical switch. Um, they were bought by JDS Uniphase at the height of the internet bubble in what was the biggest uh, exit of any company in North Carolina at the time. I think it was $750 million <clears throat> for that exit. So that was good for MCNC. That was a windfall. It was also a big political problem because uh, the president and the chair of the board had been encouraged to put some personal skin in the game uh, to help make this deal happen. And they, of course, made big money off of that when it happened. And uh, even though MCNC was an independent nonprofit. There were a lot of people in the uh, state legislature that thought that money should come to the state. So there was a lot of uh, 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 angst about that at MCNC. Um, so, and MCNC was split up into three pieces. The, uh, there was the original MCNC, which became, which is the networking part that remains today. Um, there was the contract research part that was uh, the IP developed microelectronics uh, work. Uh, even though there was a clean room on site, clean rooms uh, are uh, short lived technology like everything else. And by that time, the clean room wasn't very clean by current standards. So they couldn't work on state of the art processors, but they, so they mostly worked on packaging things at that point. Um, and then the uh, the other piece was a uh, early stage. Uh, technology investment fund called NCIDEA was created uh, as the third piece of MCNC. In addition, in an effort to appease the General Assembly, $30 million was given to create the Rural Internet Access Authority, uh, which pretty quickly changed its name to ENC because of the unfortunate uh, collision with the uh, Recording Industry Artists Association, uh, which we were battling with continually over uh, uh, music, uh, Napster, back in those days at the university. So it was a it was a continuous flow of complaints from from the RIAA to through us to the universities uh, uh, back in those days. So MCNC split. This uh, ENC, as I mentioned before, was run by uh, was started by Jane Smith Patterson, uh, and they were all about uh, getting broadband or we didn't call it broadband then, but at least internet access in the hands of uh, rural people in North Carolina. So after that um, sort of really busy time in the late 90s and right around uh, 2000, uh, I think of it as a, the early aughts as a uh, uh, sort of period of consolidation for us. There weren't so many brand new things starting. But we were ex trying to expand our fiber network, uh, the uh, and uh, and add more different kinds of institutions to the network. So uh, we were getting uh, we were, we were the internet provider for state government, and they were expanding their use of us. And we were connecting some municipalities um, on the national level. Uh, the uh, uh, scenic. Uh, which is sort of our equivalent, roughly our equivalent in California, was looking to expand their uh, their network and get fiber for their own use. No, uh, uh, Daryl, you have to be quiet in this part. Uh, so they wanted 
uh, fiber all the way to Seattle, and then they uh, realized they wanted a, uh, a path, a, a diverse path back, and uh, found out that was probably going to have to go as far east as Denver. Uh, they were looking at what that would cost and realized that was a large fraction of what a national footprint would cost. So they went around to the other uh, people they knew at universities and uh, and regional networks and said, you know, if if we all invest some money here, we can build a national footprint where we have control of the fiber. Um, so they got a collection of, I think it was about 15 investors, including Internet2, um, who went in for double the, the standard investment and, uh, and they uh, bought the, they did an IRU for fiber with a national footprint. They got Cisco as a partner to, to provide uh, optical gear and uh, their, the plan for that network was it was going to be completely research based and not have any production traffic on it. That proved to not be financially st sustainable and so they ended up uh, basically competing directly with Internet2 and that created all manner of uh, conflict inside the research and education world at that point in time and factions developed and uh, friends quit being friends and all kinds of fun stuff happened as a result of that. And that was a bit distracting for us because uh, Duke had put up the money to invest in that and uh, so it was a bifurcation of effort on our part. We had to spend money to get connected to both networks. The universities were spending money to be connected to both networks uh, and arguing about which one should be used for what purposes and uh, it was generally not that much fun from a political uh, a lowercase p political point of view uh, because of our proximity to state government we also uh, had uppercase political stuff to deal with at, at times and there was a lot of uh, after effect from the MCNC breakup and the uh, uh, the spin out of Kronos uh, that lasted for a number of years uh, where basically we had to lay low for uh, five or six years and just try to not be in the press in any way, shape, or form because it never worked out well for us. Towards the, uh, the mid-aughts, uh, we had a Lieutenant Governor Beverly Perdue who was very excited about getting all the K-12 schools on high quality internet and uh, got a small amount of funding to do a study to find out what it would cost to do that, uh, that we were uh, deeply involved in and so over six to nine months we went and figured out what it would cost to connect all the K-12 through schools in North Carolina and came up with a number of 24 million dollars a year uh, recurring. The General Assembly in their infinite wisdom appropriated six million dollars one time. Um, they apparently didn't understand this but so that ended up being a, uh, we decided the best way to use that was to do a better study to convince them that uh, that they needed to give us recurring money. So a whole year was spent spending that six million dollars visiting every school district, finding out exactly what the situation was on the ground and what it was going to take to uh, uh, to solve it and came back with this basically the same number plus a uh, recommendation that uh, the state create an engineering team in the middle that could work for the school districts because a big problem that the school districts had, especially the smaller ones, was they were understaffed on IT and they were frequently uh, either sold long-term contracts that made no sense whatsoever um, or upsold on all kinds of other services that they didn't fully understand. So the idea was this engineering group in the middle would understand those things and could work for the schools without uh, them having to worry about being inappropriately upsold on, on various things or having to buy the wrong thing. The General Assembly took this report and finally did fund not quite as much as was originally recommended but 20 million dollars a year and we figured we could make that work. So uh, and that resulted in getting all the K-12 schools in North Carolina uh, connected to the network. So that was a pretty big deal uh, for us. And in that process, uh, Lieutenant Governor Purdue became Governor Purdue. Um, a side, a completely unrelated story to that is 
Governor Purdue had a communications guy on her team named Mark Johnson. And I would occasionally get an email or a text saying, call me now. And uh, I tried to fix that the first time. It didn't work. Uh, the, uh, I just started ignoring them afterwards. I, uh, I eventually met the other Mark Johnson, and he thought that was a pretty funny story. And, uh, and I had a chance to tell that to get Governor Purdue, and she was like, I hope I didn't say anything bad. So uh, uh, after that, and maybe these next two slides are mildly out of order. Um, so around 2009, 2010, the FCC wrote this national broadband plan. Uh, Blair Levin was the guy who wrote that or was responsible for preparing, preparing that plan at the FCC. After that was done, he left the FCC. He formed a, uh, a nonprofit called Gig.U uh, around the concept that universities would be good catalysts for getting uh, high quality broadband to the home uh, in the areas around the campuses uh, because their communities were used to having high quality service on campus and would want it at home as well. Um, in North Carolina, Duke, North Carolina State, and UNC bought into that wholesale, uh, dove into it. Um, they uh, sort of built on some of the stuff that Google had done when they were uh, shopping the notion that they were going to bring Google Fiber into communities. And there was a big piece of that being that Google wanted streamlined permitting. So uh, in our area, uh, they gathered together nine uh, municipalities plus the uh, Council of Government uh, and got them to all agree on common permitting for uh, for fiber and um, fiber construction and to uh, use the city of Raleigh as the uh, sort of the ombudsman for all that and uh, then they did an RFP to try and to get attract a service provider. AT&T ended up winning the, the RFP and, and promising to deliver gigabit ethernet to town. Um, Google decided to come anyway after that. And uh, I think it was a pretty tight race on who brought fiber to the home to our area first, AT&T or Google. They were very close. Uh, but the end result has been that there are some places in the triangle where you have a choice of three gigabit level providers. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live in one of those. I have AT&T, Google, and Spectrum all willing to sell me uh, at least a gigabit at my house. Uh, unfortunately, I can drive 10 miles away and DSL is the only thing available. So it's, it's a little bit uh, uneven in how that's uh, distributed. So. Around the same time, uh, also uh, following on the FCC's uh, uh, national broadband plan uh, and uh, following the sort of economic crash of 2008 uh, as part of the stimulus program was this Broadband Technologies Opportunities Program. Um, MCNC happened to already have in its strategic plan getting fiber to all of our core pops in the network so we had an idea of what we wanted to do and uh, we proposed uh, exactly that in the first round of BTOP uh, even though we knew exactly what we wanted to do the timeline was really compressed and for a, what was then a 40 person company putting a man years worth of work into six weeks was kind of an all hands on deck effort for us um, and we won and we were very happy and excited and then we started getting pressure that we need to do a bigger project. And so just as we were starting to implement that, uh, we did another application for a much bigger project to do fiber uh, around the perimeter of the state, uh, which we ended up winning as well. Uh, a couple of details about that. So there was a lot of encouragement to partner with uh, service providers and also from our perspective a lot of concern that we would have pushback from service providers so uh, our inoculation technique was to call all the service providers together in a meeting and ask tell them we wanted to 
partner with anybody. They could. It was a five x return on your money. It was a twenty percent match, uh, and uh, only one provider was interested at all. It was a tiny little uh, fiber provider called FRC. Um, they uh, they agreed to split the match with us on that. Uh, we did have quite a lot of arguments with them because they wanted to reduce the fiber count. Uh, they were arguing for 48 strands, and we were arguing for 144. We ended up on that piece of it, uh, mostly getting 96. Uh, also, in their interest in promoting scarcity rather than abundance, uh, they made us uh, skip a small eight-mile section near Wilmington where they had a couple of strands available that were uh, going to be constraining for us long term, uh, which they thought was a good thing. Um, so we had enough money uh, to do the match as a result of the, uh, the Kronos spin out and MCNC breakup. We have, uh, MCNC has a, a bit of an endowment, so we had the we were unique among our peers around the country in having a, uh, a cash on hand to do the uh, to do the match it was a big deal. In round two, that was a much bigger project, and we didn't want to do it in the first place. Um, we got our match from the Golden Leaf Foundation, which is tobacco settlement money in North Carolina, which was uh, designed to promote anything but the tobacco industry for creating jobs in the state, and uh, they gave us twenty four million in cash for match. On that, so uh, that was uh, a key part of our winning. That is, we we made it easy for the NTIA to give us that money, because uh, unlike most people, we didn't have any in-kind match or any of that stuff. We just had money, um, and they that made it an easy answer for them. So uh, that led to uh, a period <laughs> that took several years to get that fiber, uh, those projects uh, approved, and get the fiber built. Um, and um, and then much of what's been going on has been the, the continuation of those fiber efforts around the state, uh, you know, supplementing what was done then. I guess now there's some uh, some more federal money coming from Middle Mile Networks that's being applied to that. Uh, so on the that has led to some uh, some research projects. Uh, of note that are kind of currently active. One is called uh, Fabric, which is run out of the, the, the key uh, institution there is UNC, it's the Rinsey Institute at, at UNC. It's called Fabric, which is a test bed for advanced uh, networking technologies. It's a kind of a follow on to the Gini uh, program at NS NSF. And the idea is to be able to test new internet architectures at scale. So it's got a national footprint. It includes compute and storage uh, capabilities scattered around the country, uh, very high speed. I think they have got a terabit across the core of their network uh, in places. And uh, they are also integrating with other test beds uh, around the country that exist. So uh, in this uh, looks like it's going to be continued for a number of years going forward um, as a test bed. So the idea is a researcher can come with a proposal to uh, to try some novel uh, to set up across the network, and they can give them a slice of the capability uh, that has compute, storage, uh, uh, networking paths, and they can uh, can try out things at a uh, national. Uh, national scale. Uh, the website is there. Uh, roughly simultaneous with that, the NSF was had this other program uh, for test beds called Platform for Advanced Wireless Research. Uh, NC State has a uh, one of the test beds there that they call AirPaw. This is a very clever play on their Wolfpack uh, name. So. Uh, Everybody's from UNC can shake your head now. Um, so they are really focused on uh, the use of drones uh, and uh, and wireless networking, uh, and they have uh, test bed setups that are they have a uh, a rural test bed. NC State is the uh, uh, the land grant college in the state, and so they're 
uh, and as a result, they have a farm outside of Raleigh, and that, so they have a test bed uh, for drone use on in the farm setting. Uh, the town of Cary nearby uh, gives them a suburban uh, footprint, and the town of Raleigh uh, gives them an urban footprint. And a similar concept, in a way, to um, to fabric, and that it's a test bed environment, so a researcher can come to them with a uh, with a scenario and they can build it and test it in uh, in the real world. Coming soon is uh, we're in sort of active at the moment. So NC State and IBM started a quantum initiative back in 2018 that's beginning to look like something real now. Um, and this is probably going to lead to a, a quantum networking test bed in the research triangle area. Um, utilizing some of the fiber that's available now. Uh, since that initial fiber that we bought, MCNC and Duke partnered to overbuild that with 432 strands of fiber uh, around the triangle. So that's now a plentiful resource. Uh, and um, so expect, uh, as soon as somebody can tell me what quantum networking is, that there will probably be a, a test bed somewhere in the, uh, the Raleigh area. So, um, and finally, um, what's next? I, you know, I think the quantum stuff is coming. Uh, the I think we're also entering uh, sort of what a friend of mine refers to as the post bandwidth era, uh, where we look at things other than just pure bandwidth as as key areas of development. I know Jason Livinggood's supposed to be talking about uh, their low latency efforts at Comcast somewhere here. Uh, I haven't seen him in the room yet, but um, uh, I think that's the kind of thing where we're going to see activity more than uh, than just pure bandwidth plays going forward. So uh, I think that's the end of my remarks, and there's a whole five minutes left if anybody has a question. Hi, great talk. Um, I'm Scott Johnson with Spacely Packets. Um, recent research suggests that um, quantum entanglement actually creates a quantum scale wormhole between the entangled particles. Um, the, this leads to a potential logical conclusion that if you can entangle something large enough to uh, pass signals not blocked in a Faraday type of method, such as uh, perhaps a, a ring of carbon atoms, that um, since space is folded, your latency goes away. And that is where we should look toward uh, for quantum networking, as opposed to simply using it to uh, protect quantum key distribution, or protect the encryption key distribution, rather, uh, over fibers. True quantum networking, when we realize it, won't need any layer one. I'm not prepared to dispute or confirm anything that you just said. Anything else? You're going to have to have a dare back. All right. Thank you. Thank you.